international law is clear that you still have to minimize the risk yes. to civilians. And it would could be reasonably argued that Israel has done the opposite, it has not tried to minimize the risk. And, and the death toll is a testament to that. There have been reports of uh, hospital staff, doctors being shot point blank, uh, bullet wounds See, to the that's head. Where, um, that's where, if you want to make a broad argument about the civilian toll, I, I have investigated a lot of the specific claims. If there are specific claims of an Israeli soldier targeting a doctor in that way, then I want to see it and I want to investigate it and we should go after it. Your opponent has accused you of being in the pocket of arms manufacturers who contributed thousands to your campaign and of APAC, which I believe gave 200,000 to your campaign. Can you seriously expect voters to believe that pro-Israel lobbyists are not influencing policy in that region? Of course, pro-Israel lobbies are influencing circumstances, just like, you know, people on the other side are influencing as well in a variety of different ways. How many elections has Hamas held since they won? And you're right. Well, well they were never recognized. You're right. Can you seriously tell me that Israel is completely off base? They believe that if they don't protect themselves, they will be eliminated. If you think that Donald Trump's going to be better for the Palestinian people, you're not really reading history very well here or reading what he said. Is it a testament to this administration's failures that both Harris and Trump are now neck and neck? Well, I don't think so, no. Hello and welcome to The Muslim Viewpoint, a new video podcast series powered by the nonprofit national media platform, American Muslim Today. I'm your host, Rifat Malik. We are continuing our Get Out the Vote series. And today we are joined by senior Democratic Congressman Adam Smith, who is running for re-election in Washington's 9th Congressional District. Representative Smith is a ranking member of the influential House Armed Services Committee, and he spoke to me earlier today. Representative, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. So I just wanted to kick off with uh, the, the most pressing question, I think, in many ways. We're just days away from one of the most consequential elections in recent history, going back to January the 6th, 2021, the ensuing universal condemnation of former President Trump's actions, including by his own party and his subsequent criminal indictments and convictions. Is it a testament to this administration's failures that both Harris and Trump are now neck and neck? Well, I don't think so, no. Um, I think it is a testimony to a deeply divided electorate. I mean, Donald Trump got elected back in 2016, long before Joe Biden or Kamala Harris became candidates. So I think looking at it that way simply empowers Trump. Um, you know, I, I just do not agree with that assessment. But do you think there was any failure in the Democratic Party's messaging? Have they come across to the electorate? Yeah, I have run many, many, many campaigns. Everybody's got an opinion. Didn't like this, didn't like that. Now, messages have not been perfect. But I think Kamala Harris, you know, in particular, has come out and made it very, very clear. She's run a strong campaign. And she's been clear and articulate in her message. She's gone after Trump. She's explained why her economic me message is better, why her vision for the country is better. Has she answered every single question exactly right? No, none of us do. OK, you know, if you haven't ever done this before, it's actually a heck of a lot more difficult than it looks. But I do think a double standard has been put in place, a double standard by people who claim to be concerned about Trump. And I've summed it up this way. So Donald Trump, every day he goes out there, he says the most outrageous things in the world, brutally insults people. He's called Kamala Harris a fascist three dozen times, a communist, the antichrist. He's called her supporters vermin, scum, everything you could possibly imagine. He's also just done completely incomprehensible answers to questions, uh, looking like he doesn't know what he's talking about. We're going on all over, all over the place. He had January 6th, okay? He basically led an insurrection against this country. And I hear people, you know, even people who claim to be concerned about Trump, who basically sum all that up like, yeah, okay, you know, Trump's a narcissistic psychopath, and he's sort of been on fascism, and he's kind of a racist, you know, and he wants to ban Muslims from the country and everything. But, you know, that, that answer that Harris gave, you know, five minutes into that interview, you know, the third thing she said, I don't think it was quite clear. So, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, come on. All right. The standard that Harris is being held to is ridiculous. Now, do you want me to tell you that she's got the answer to every single problem that ever came down the road, that she's got this detailed economic plan that's somehow going to figure out how to get us out of our $33 trillion debt, how to deal... No, of course she doesn't, all right? But she's not, a, she's not going to try to overthrow the country, okay? She's not going to take vengeance on her enemies. She doesn't accuse immigrants of eating dogs and cats. She doesn't say that she's going to deport every single immigrant that she, she can get her hands on. This is not a difficult call. It's not even close, all right? If you are any kind of a progressive, 
come on. Okay. You know, can you pick nits with stuff that have? Sure. You know, gosh, I, I'm a pretty good campaigner. I'm a reasonably articulate person. Every day I can go back in my mind and say, Ugh, ah, you know, I didn't quite say that right. Or gosh, I forgot about this. I did this. I should have said that. Come on, people. There is no question who the better candidate is. If you believe in representative democracy, if you believe in honesty, if you believe in the rule of law, if you believe in immigration, okay, if you believe in not being racist and not being misogynist, if any of the, if you check any of those boxes, then you should be out there every second of every day between now and when the polls close on November 5th, doing everything in your power to get Kamala Harris elected president. One of the reasons why the Democrats are having issues, and I think you will agree this has been a major issue, is the issue of Gaza. This administration's unwavering support for Israel, which the UN says is committing a plausible genocide and whose leader is facing prosecution for war crimes, as a long-standing ranking member of the Armed Services, Services Committee, Armed is America following an ethical foreign policy in the Middle East? Well, I think you're absolutely right that that is a major issue and a major concern, and it should be. This is an important issue. It's something that absolutely should matter to people. It's literally life or death. It's an enormous crisis throughout the Middle East. People are suffering horribly. But again, let, let's remember, Donald Trump wanted to let Netanyahu annex the West Bank. Donald Trump moved the embassy for the U.S. from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Donald Trump has made it 100% clear that he will make no effort whatsoever to check Israel. He does not recognize, you know, any Palestinian rights, cut off funding for UNRWA back in 2018, which I opposed. And I saw some others said, well, you know, Trump says he's going to bring peace to the Middle East. <laughs> okay. You know, he's made it very clear what that vision is. And it is no future for the Palestinian people. Yes, it is a, a very, very difficult si situation. Um, and I certainly understand people's concerns about it. But to think that Donald Trump is the better option, I can't see that. Someone will have to articulate that argument for me. But well, considering this administration has been involved in what's going on out there, obviously, you know, we are supporting a regime of an extremist right wing leader, i.e. Netanyahu, who has been indicted on corruption charges and some of whose coalition members have called for the genocide of Palestinians with over 43,000, mainly women and children killed so far and a policy of blocking humanitarian aid, which I'm sure you recognize or I know many people recognize is a violation of Section 6201 of the U.S. Foreign Assistance Act, how can we still justify continuing to give military aid to Israel? There are a number of different pieces of that. I'm not going to be able to answer this in, in 30 seconds or, or a minute. But first of all, there's broader context to this. Israel is unquestionably threatened, okay? They are threatened by Hamas, by Hezbollah, and by Iran. And frankly, they have been for the entire 75 years of their existence, 76 years, I guess it is now. And I've met with a number of different groups about this over the course of 25 or 30 years. And I have said, if there is not support for the fact that Israel has a right to exist, that complicates things. And they have been put under that pressure, okay? You know, the UN refuses to recognize Hamas as a terrorist organization. You talk about humanitarian violations. Hamas does it to their own people. OK, you know, they use human shields in warfare. Um, they kill their own people if they view them as collaborating. Um, so, you know, it, it's not like there's a great alternative here. What we have pushed for and what the Biden administration has pushed for is a ceasefire with the return of the hostages. That's never been offered up. OK, the hostages have never been returned. So it is a much more complicated picture than that. And we I don't support Benjamin Netanyahu. OK, he was the duly elected leader of Israel in a democratic election, um, you know, just like I didn't support Donald Trump, but it didn't mean I stopped supporting the United States. The Biden administration has tried to put pressure on Israel to get them to get to a peace agreement with Lebanon, with Hamas. And I think crucially, and what we should do is we should place far more sanctions on the Israeli government, on Israelis for the settlements in the West Bank. But you at least have an administration that is willing to have that conversation now. You know, no Republican that I can think of has expressed even the tiniest little bit of sympathy for anybody, anybody in Palestine. Well, can I ask you, with your extensive military knowledge and expertise, can you tell me if it is ever American military policy to bomb schools and hospitals in a conflict zone when there is clear intelligence that significant loss of civilian life is certain? Yeah, I can answer that question. Look, the law of war, regrettably, is kind of clear on this. You can't target civilians. But if your adversary is embedding military operations within civilians, you are then required to do a very difficult balancing act. All right. What is the benefit of going after um, the military target with the, um, the, the killing of civilians that would happen in that? And the law of war says you are allowed to attack those sites. And it's been frustrating for me because I can't even get people on the pro-Palestinian side to acknowledge that that is what Hamas and Hezbollah have been doing. 
And if we could acknowledge it, we could put pressure on Hamas and Hezbollah to stop doing it, um, to stop, you know, launching rockets from hospitals and mosques and apartment buildings, um, then that would shift the equation. But the, the truth is, in the law of war, if people are attacking you from within a civilian location, whatever it is, you do have the right to attack them in that location. I do not agree with the decisions that Israel has made about not balancing that as much as they should have against the cost to civilians. But if you are being attacked from a hospital, from a mosque, from a school, from an apartment building, the law of war is very clear that you do have a right to attack that site. Uh, my question was, would an Amer American military commander yeah. make that decision? Because I've, seen, I've yeah. seen reports where retired generals have said that no American military um, general or, or official policy would actually do something like that. It depends on the specifics of it, okay? Are you asking me, would a military commander attack a civilian site where there was no military reason for it? No, and if they did, and this has happened in our history, and we've, we've court-martialed people for war crimes in Vietnam and elsewhere. We've done something which, by the way, Hamas and Iran and Hezbollah would never in a million years do, okay, if people do that. If somebody attacks a civilian site and there is no military objective, you're absolutely right. If, in fact, there is a military objective, you know, contained within that civilian site, then you have to make a judgment call about, you know, the risk to civilian life versus the risk of allowing that military site to continue op operating. And it's going to depend on the international instances of that case. But, but uh, Representative, case. international law is clear that you still have to minimize yeah. the risk yes. to uh, civilians. Yes. And it would could be reasonably argued that Israel has done the opposite, it has not tried to minimize the risk. And, and the death toll is a testament to that. I mean, that is something that is clear for everyone to see. You don't have to even investigate that the numbers are there, the, the horrific deaths are there, that there have been reports of, of uh, hospital staff, doctors being shot point blank, uh, bullet wounds See, to the that's head. Where, um, that's where, you know, if you want to make a broad argument about the civilian toll, I, I have investigated a lot of the specific claims. If there are specific claims of an Israeli soldier targeting a doctor in that way, then I want to see it and I want to investigate it and we should go after it. Okay. I have not actually seen that as I've looked at it. I've heard a lot of different charges thrown around. It is absolutely clear um, that this has had a horrible impact on civilians. War has a horrible impact on civilians. It always does. Well, th those are testimonies. Wars. Those are testimonies from Western doctors, including American and British doctors who have I'll been be to Gaza. To those charges. And... I've seen many of them and many of them have not played out exactly the way they were described. I do not simply take the word of people who are on side. Of the, I got to investigate. I got to look into it. I got to see what is said. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm happy to try and get you that information when, as soon as we can. I just wanted to go back to the issue of congressional support for Israel, which while you say that America has been putting pressure on Israel to reduce the, the loss of life and uh, restrict some of its actions, nevertheless, um, the, the funding is still going through. Uh, there were some temporary restrictions on arms, but again, that was lifted. Um, your opponent, the Democratic candidate in your area, Melissa Chowdhury, has accused you of being in the pocket of arms manufacturers who contributed thousands to your campaign and of APAC, which I believe gave 200,000 to your campaign. That's just part of the 50 million or so it's given to congressional members this election cycle, which is a fraction of the hundreds of millions given over the years to members of Congress. Can you seriously expect voters to believe that pro-Israel lobbyists are not influencing policy in that region? Well, you conflated a whole bunch of different circumstances there in a very, very unfair way. Of course, pro-Israel lobbies are influencing circumstances, just like you know people on the other side are influencing as well in a variety of different ways. There are a whole bunch of left-leaning groups who contribute to campaigns, who spread messages, who do that. Yes, they lobby for that. But I'll tell you what, can I seriously, yes, I can seriously tell you that the decisions I make are based on policy. I take legal contributions. I can't think of a single contributor that I've ever had that I haven't voted against at least one time. Where APAC is concerned, the single biggest issue that they were concerned about was the Iran nuclear deal. They opposed it, I supported it publicly and unabashedly and continued to oppose it when Donald Trump, sorry, opposed Donald Trump when he repealed it. I, back in 2018, signed on to a letter with Ila Omar and a bunch of others telling them not to cut off UNRWA. So yeah, I can seriously tell you that I make the decisions based on what goes on in my district. And I take legal contributions from a variety of different other people. And by the way, the way people calculate um, APAC contributions is not terribly accurate. You know, anyone who's ever supported a APAC backed candidate is considered to be an APAC contribution. All right. So yes, I have no hesitation whatsoever talking about my record and representing my district and putting my district first. And by the way, I have a ton of pro-Israel people who live in my district.
Okay. This is an issue that deeply, deeply divides my district. There is considerable passion on both sides. And those, you know, I have a number of synagogues in my district. It just happens to be that's where most of the Jewish um, synagogues are, um, which are Island and Seattle. They have all been vandalized. My house has been vandalized. Okay. Um, yes, it is a very, very intense issue out here. And I listen to both sides and try to make the decision that I think is best. I know that you said that Israel's right to exist is threatened. Many would argue that it's Israel's actions for decades in that region that has threatened its own existence because of a brutal occupation. Isn't it expected that people will uprise and there will be resistance? Let's walk through the history here, okay? And let me say that after October 7th, a number of people came out and said, you can't condemn that without looking at the context. And by the way, I completely agree with that. You can't take one incident without looking at the context. But what those same people are completely unwilling to do is to look at the context of what Israel is doing. And ever since 1948, that has been the case. Israel has faced a number of people who have felt that they shouldn't have been created in the first place. And there's a number of different arguments for why they shouldn't have been created in the first place. We don't need to walk through all of those. Um, the bottom line is, from before they were existed, through their entire existence, they have been challenged. So you cannot view Israel's actions without that context. They believe that if they don't protect themselves, they will be eliminated. And can you honestly tell me, can you seriously tell me that Israel is completely off base? The Palestinian Liberation Organization, which a lot of people like to talk about as being a reaction to the 1967 war where Israel took land that was not granted them by the UN. The Palestinian Liberation Organization was formed in 1964. It existed to wipe Israel out. And they continually face that. Now, I don't agree with everything they've done in response to that, but you've got to look at that context in their actions to try to protect themselves. Well, that was at a time, Representative, that was at a time when, when the PLO were considered a terrorist organization. They then became a legitimate government, and they are essentially been governing in the West Bank. Uh, in legitimately, Iran picked um, this up happens, black. This happens all over the world where you have, at one point, an organization is a terrorist organization. Sure. Then it's recognized, and it gets political legitimacy, and then it is considered a, a legitimate a power. Completely so that's what would have happened. Happened. Had, for instance, if you go back to, I think it was 2005, when there were the first ever elections in the Ga Gaza, Gaza and Hamas was elected. And that may not have been the, the desired outcome, but isn't that what democracy is? If someone is well, elected, then you have to allow them to govern. Here's what democracy isn't, okay? How many elections has Hamas held since they won? That's not democracy. And you're right. Well, well they were never recognized. Right so, so whether they had right elections or not, it's relevant. Evolved. But my point is, it has been a rotating group of organizations and countries that have wanted to eliminate Israel. I'll grant you, it hasn't always remained the same. I mean, back in 1948 and 56 and 73, it was Egypt and Jordan and Iraq, and I'm forgetting one, oh, Syria, um, you know, and Jordan and Egypt made peace. The PLO signed a peace Iran, accord, signed a peace now, accord and recognized Israel's right to exist. So that's that, not the case. Not acknowledging is, okay, so they agreed to stop trying to eliminate Israel. And then Iran and Hamas and Hezbollah and the Houthis, they didn't agree. Hamas stood for election in 2005. They won the election overwhelmingly. There was an 80% turnout. Um, uh, pre former President Carter was one of the observers, um, and he said that it was there, a free actually. and fair election. Yeah. Well, then, then you will know as well that it was a free and fair election. The sure. West and Israel refused to accept the result of that democratic process, and then we are where we are. So that's, yeah, well, I think well, that would well, be the well, counter-argument well, well, well. to that. Hamas in 2005, their charter was brazenly anti-Semitic, and basically they were going to eliminate the state of israel so you wanted israel to go ahead and accept hamas on their border as a kind that made no bones about the fact you don't have a right to exist i mean it was it's that's not my understanding that's not my understanding of what their position was they were coming have to the fold and charter? i believe there was a there was, I believe there was a, a survey at the time where Israelis were asked, would they want to have peace with Hamas and recognize Hamas? And I think something like 50% of the population said they would. We want to go back to history. Can we go a little bit more recent? In 1991, President George Bush senior delayed Israel's loan guarantees until it halted its settlements in the West Bank and Gaza and entered peace talks with Palestinians. He defied AIPAC and Israel's then Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir actually capitulated. The settlements were halted and the talks led to the Madrid, Madrid Peace Conference. So why have the Democrats failed to take decisive action to stop what Netanyahu is doing the in Gaza. circumstances are different here because of Iran. Okay. In 1991, there was no army, no you know, series of terrorist groups who were specifically targeting and trying to eliminate Israel. Twice, just in the last year, Iran has launched well over 300 missiles, drones, and you know, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles at Iran. Hezbollah has been firing into Iran, uh, fire, sorry, firing into Israel since October 8th. Okay. Israel is directly under attack from Iran and Hezbollah, occasionally from the Houthis. Okay. So to cut them off is to leave them vulnerable to that attack. And frankly, to um, encourage that, not encourage is the wrong word, um, is to make it more difficult to deter that attack. 
Um, so that's the difference in circumstances. But look, I think I think that option should be on the table personally. I think, you know, depending on the circumstances, I think the U.S. should try to figure out that leverage. But we need some cooperation on the other side so that we don't have Hamas, Iran and Hezbollah being given a free pass for their policy of wanting the complete destruction of Israel. As long as that free pass is there, it's harder for us to go to Israel and say, look, if you make these changes, you'll be fine. And they look at us like we're lunatics because, well, here's what Iran is doing. Here's what Hamas is doing. Here's what Hezbollah is doing. Here's what the Houthis are doing. And you want us to step back and let that happen? I do have to go. Um, I think it is an important discussion. And I, I, I'm sympathetic to the frustrations and the disagreements. And I'm always open to the conversation. But I'll end where I started. If you think that Donald Trump's going to be better for the Palestinian people, you're not really reading history very well here or reading what he well, said. Just a final question to you. Final question before you go. What about what would you say to uh, Democratic uh, Muslim uh, Democrats uh, who want to support the Democratic Party? They feel disillusioned. They feel let down. If you take just the example of the DNC, a Palestinian American delegate was not allowed to address the main uh, DNC stage. Yeah. Would, wouldn't would that have been the minimum? Well, I'll tell you what done? I'd say. Politics is about big coalitions. Okay. You know, policies, you gotta you gotta work with people who you don't agree with. All right. You are never going to be in a situation where you are going to get everything you want out of any one elected official for that matter. Forget a party. Okay. And it's a difficult choice. You know, you have to make compromise and difficult choices about what is your best option? What is your best choice? Every day when I'm in Congress, I got to take votes on things where, well, I like this, but I don't like that. Okay. But there's not a yes, maybe button. Okay. I have to go say, well, am I for it or am I not? How do I balance all of those different pieces of it? And that's what you have to do when you make a vote. There's no perfect choice. And these issues are very, very difficult. The way people dumb them down and simplify them and say, oh, the other side is evil and terrible and corrupt. And that's the only reason I'm not getting what I want. That's just not the way it is. And I would urge people to be aware of that, you know, saying, well, the only reason U.S. supports Israel is because they're corrupt and terrible and awful. No, it is absolutely not. You may disagree with those of us. And I'm sort of in the middle on this. I don't I'm not Donald Trump. I'm not Israel. Do whatever you want. No consequence. But the reason that I'm not exactly where people on the uh, Palestinian side are, I laid it out here and I can lay it out in greater detail. There are absolutely reasons for it. And you simply have to make choices in a broad coalition of people who have legitimate disagreements. And in this case, again, it's not a tough call on a wide range of issues. OK, certainly. Uh, but even on the central issue, Donald Trump has is not going to be good uh, for the Muslim people. I can 100 percent assure you of that. OK, thank yeah. you so much, Representative. Really appreciate you taking the time. To and speak I do to appreciate you giving me the chance. I think these discussions are really important. And let me just say, I've tried to have conversations about this frequently. I get shouted down and insulted and can't even get a word out. So it is much, much better in a democracy, sorry, representative government, to have a conversation like this. So I appreciate you giving me the chance. Thank you so much. Take care.